This is Mrs. Bidwell. Welcome to Settling the West. And in this screencast, we'll be covering parts of the Alabama Course of Study Standard 11.1. It opens up with a picture of what represents Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny took place at two separate times in American history. The first one was prior to the Civil War and it actually contributed to the outbreak of the Civil War and then you had another one that took place after the Civil War and contributed to the growth of industry in the United States. This woman represents the belief that we were destined by God or blessed by God to control all of the territory from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast and it is through Manifest Destiny that a lot of the new settlers arrived in the West. What attracted settlers to the West? The idea that if they if they went out on their own, then they could make it. Um, and that was fueled lots, largely by the discovery of gold in California. In 1848, gold was discovered and hundreds of thousands of people came out to the West to strike it rich. It wasn't just gold that they found. They found gold, silver, copper, lead, and all of these helped to fuel the industries in the East, which also contributed to our industrial growth, which we'll talk about in Chapter 14. Uh, one of the more famous was Pikes Peak. Uh, so many people had come out after hearing about Pikes Peak, and a very famous quote was Pikes Peak or bust, and so many came out to get rich that it soon became known as uh, Pikes Hoax. Another famous discovery was the Comstock load. If you've ever heard the expression the mother load, like somebody has struck it rich, um, it is a reference to this time period in American history. The Comstock load was a vein of silver discovered by a man by the name of Henry Comstock. And it was located in Six Mile Canyon, Nevada. And because of the amount of silver that he found, very soon a city called Virginia City, Nevada sprung up. And that was a pattern that you saw repeated a lot in the West. You had these towns that seemingly sprang up overnight because all of these people would rush in to take advantage of these new discoveries. The towns grew so quickly that there was, there was no type of government structure. And so law and order was maintained by vigilance committees. And so what you see here is a picture of some vigilantes from one of these towns. Now just as quickly as these towns sprang up, they disappeared when everybody left. The graphic that you see on the screen in front of you is a map that shows you where different minerals across the United States are located but I would like to direct your attention over to the west. Now you will notice that copper is found in the New Mexico Territory and the Arizona Territory as well as Utah. You have iron and steel mills located in Wyoming and Colorado uh, in Utah and in Kansas and in Texas. You have silver and gold mining in the New Mexico Territory in Arizona, California, Nevada, Idaho, Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, and Montana. So you see that there are several different areas across the West. Now I do also want to point out to you very specifically that Colorado was where there was plenty of gold and silver to be found. And there was also a place called Leadville, which as you can imagine, that's where they discovered lead. It was in Colorado as well. You had discovery of gold in the Black Hills of the Dakota Territory. You had copper discovered in Montana. And you had all of these different areas where these different minerals were discovered. And remember I mentioned copper in Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico. Now, you can see where I was going with this. You have a graphic organizer that I would like for you to copy down into your charts and diagrams of your notebook. But where were some of those locations that I mentioned just a moment ago? If you'd like to pause here, back up the video, and fill that out, you certainly may. So, I just told you that there was silver that was located in Nevada, copper in Montana, gold in the Dakota Territory, gold in Colorado, and lead and silver in Leadville, Colorado. So if you need to make any corrections, please do so before moving on. This is an activity that we did in class. We were asking what did all these things have in common because I want you to understand that 
what started out as an individual or a family effort out west, whether it was an, you know miners coming out to strike it rich, families coming out to set up farms in the west, very quickly those economic ventures became commercial ventures. And so what all these things have in common is that ultimately all these things were involved in the meatpacking industry. And when we get, I think it's in chapter 15, we'll talk about how captains of industry organized their businesses to take advantage of all of these resources. Now, we're shifting gears and going to talk about ranching and cattle drives. You see here a graphic of all the different cattle trails, and this is where you see the, the long drive come into play. Individuals during, right, during the Civil War and then continuing after the Civil War for um, some time, it became lucrative to raise cattle. And that is because Eastern markets realized that they could get rich raising these cattle and then selling them for slaughter to feed the Union Army. And something that contributed to that as well was the open range. The federal government provided federal lands that would allow people to l allow their cattle to graze for free. And then, of course, the long range is where cow hands would be hired to round up all of the cattle, drive them to the railheads, load them up on trains, and then ship them east for slaughter. Then along comes Gustavus Swift, and he invents the refrigerated rail car, and this allows for them to slaughter the cattle there, wherever they were uh, being raised, and then the meat being shipped east. So now keep in mind that that was an effect of the Civil War. I have here some pictures for you, because if you're like me, you're probably not too familiar with ranching and so here's a picture of the open range and you see here some cattle just out grazing. Um, here is a stereotypical view of what a cowboy may look like. Here is a real picture of what cowboys looked like back then. And of course this is the type of animal that allowed cattle ranching in the plains with its tough climate. The longhorn steer was a hardy animal. It could withstand the dry periods and the very cold winters of the plains. And it was brought over um, from, I believe it was the, the Mexicans that introduced these to the United States. But this was the animal that allowed for the, the lucrative cattle raising business. So, I told you that three things contributed to the growth of the cattle industry. You had the Civil War. Remember I told you they had to feed all those Union soldiers. You have the open range allowing people to um, let their cows graze for free. And then of course the railroads because without the railroads they were not able to ship the cattle back east for profit. So here you have another graphic organizer. Again I want you to pause. I want you to answer the question what allowed for the growth of the cattle industry. Now make sure you pay attention to the pictures and explain, come up with a sentence or a, a bulleted list explaining each one of those. Now, take the time to correct your answers. Remember this is going to go in your charts and diagrams portion of your notebook. So, why? Why did this cattle industry grow? And that was because it allowed for people out in the east who had all of this money to invest because of the discovery of gold and silver and all of those things out west. And so they invested in different industries and this happened to be the cattle industry. And so you have the railroads you have the Civil War which made it profitable you have the open range which made it affordable so I want you to be able to explain why that was possible but all good things must come to an end and range wars broke out uh, one of the things that contributed to the range wars was barbed wire 
barbed wire prohibited the long drive. Now remember I told you that the long drive was where they would hire cow hands to round up all of the cattle. They would herd them to the railheads where they would load them on trains. You distinguished uh, people's different cattle by their brand that would be branded on them. And if somebody put up barbed wire, then you couldn't take the cattle that way. And so you had those who supported the open range and no barbed wire and those that did. In the end, it is going to become, with the refrigerated rail car, it's going to become more cost efficient for ranchers to enclose their cattle and pay cow hands to take care of the herds on their own property. But this conflict broke out between these competing groups until eventually supporters of barbed wire went out. Barbed wire was also supported by farmers who were coming out to the plains to establish their own farms. And that is what we'll talk about in the next section. So, as I mentioned, all good things must come to an end, and you have the end of the open range. Remember I talked to you about barbed wire. In the end, there were too many investors, and everybody was in the cattle business, which leads to oversupply. And when you have an oversupply of an item in the market, it drives your price down. And so many people just lost what they had invested. In addition to that, you had the harsh winter of 1886 and 1887 that killed off a lot of the cattle. Uh, a contributing factor to that, of course, was barbed wire. Um, but in the end, the open range is no more. So this is the end of the Settling the West of screencast. Um, if you have any questions, please see me or, or send me a message via Edmodo. And please be looking soon for the next installment. Goodbye.